Well, good morning. That's called the unexpected. So uh, today's message is titled An Unlikely King. We're starting a series on the book of Matthew. We're just going to do that for the next four weeks. I know that's not enough time to do all of Matthew, so we won't. But, uh, but we'll do some pieces of it. And then it's almost Easter. Can you believe it? And uh, we're pretty full this morning. You, you guys notice that? It's good to see you. By the way, 10 minutes before service, if you're looking for a chair now, if you were here 10 minutes before, you could have sat anywhere. They would have given you room on the stage. So, You guys did great. You said you weren't able to sing. You did great. You sounded really good. The Holy Spirit filter, is that what it was? So how many of you have ever seen in person a pole vault meet where they do the pole vault? Have you seen that? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Good, good to see you back there. Oh, yeah, you saw it yesterday. That's my, that's my dealer back there. Girl Scout cookies. What are you guys thinking? <laughs> By the way, uh, Seminole, I think it was Seminole County, one of the county sheriffs, wait, I got to read this because it's so funny. One of the county sheriffs posted, alert, be on the lookout for addict, it's Flagler County, Look, be on the lookout for addictive substances being sold in Flagler County. Product sold by a gang of children known as Girl Scouts. Product sold by Easily identified by uniforms often seen outside stores. Easily identified by uniforms often seen outside stores. The sheriff's department released that as a warning. I thought that was great. So Holly's my dealer. Um, anyway, but good to see you guys today. So I got to, uh, yesterday, my niece was uh, doing pole vault, and I got to go. And one of the guys from her school, we watched him in practice. And as he practiced, I watched, and he was clearing everything that looked like a bar. I mean, it was just amazing. I was watching him. I said, man, he's got such good form. And, uh, and then the meet started, and he cleared the first obstacle, and then the second one, and he was, he's, I think he ended up winning, honestly. But then they raised it one more, and I was sitting next to his mom and dad. And so I'm sitting next to his mom and dad, and I hear him come over to his mom. By the way, it's so fun watching teenagers argue with their parents. If you if you, as your kids get older and they're no longer teenagers, there's kind of this, <laughs> I remember those days where they'd argue with you about anything. I, I don't know if you ever had this discussion with your children. I had this discussion with my children. You realize it would take less time to do what I asked you to do than for you to argue with me about what you, I'm asking you to do, right? Does this sound familiar? It's a little too familiar. Okay. Looks like, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we're watching him. He comes over to his mom. He goes, Mom, there's no way I'm clearing this. And she's like, hey, you were doing great. You just did practice. She went on and on and on. And he goes, whatever. She, he goes, quit arguing with me. And I'm like, Mom's trying to encourage you. I even said to Kristen, I said, I wish I could encourage him because I could just see. He just, it was like somebody unplugged him. It was just crazy, just the change. You know, I was like, I wish I could encourage him. To which she looks at me and she goes, you're not his coach. Which I knew meant, please don't say anything to him. So I just cheered when he made it. But anyway, so it was funny though. I literally watched him on the next run, like psych himself out. Like you could see, you could see the change and even the way he stood before he went. Now, I say all that to say this. Today, we're going to look at the book of Matthew, and we're going to look at a story that you've probably only hear around Christmas time, but it's not just for Christmas time, and I'm going to show you why. But here's the deal about Matthew. Matthew purposefully puts details in the story of Jesus for us. Because the truth for us is this. Listen, when we look at the life of Jesus, we say, well, I could never be like that. You know, Jesus says to, to imitate him, and we're supposed to be like Jesus in these ways, but, but that'll never happen because of my past, or because of this happening, or because of that happening. And the truth is, what Matthew is trying to point out is how God used and continues to use broken, messed up people. If you go see the Jesus Revolution movie, which is out. Great movie. If you haven't seen it, great movie. But here's what I'll tell you. That number one, they didn't include all the broken parts of the people they're showing. But can I also tell you something that I heard in the movie that I thought was really good? God uses broken, messed up people. And 
if you start to think you have your act together, that's when God can't use you. And when you recognize, I don't, but God can, that's when God can use you. And so we're going to look at this, and, and here's what I want you to get out of this today. This will kind of be your, your sermon in a sentence for today, okay? Because we live in a world of selfishness and self-centeredness, but if you and I will learn to put, like Jesus did, learn to put God's will before our will, God will change us. If you're struggling today, I, I, in whatever area of your life, if you will say, God, help me to put your will before my will, it will change you. Some of you are exhausted because you're so busy promoting yourself and your feelings and your emotions and your desires that you have worn yourself out. God, I want to put your will before my will. And so today we're going to look at three things, and we're going to look at this idea of how Jesus was an unlikely king, and the truth is that you and I are unlikely Christians. We, we don't deserve to have a relationship with God. We don't deserve to know Him. We don't deserve to be loved by Him, and yet He does all of those things, and that's what grace is all about, and we have to recognize it. So, number one, Jesus, or He, came from an unlikely history, and I'm going to read the history, It'll probably give you more background than you want, but it'll be fun, so... You ready to buckle in and get going? Here we go. Matthew 1, we're going to go to verse 1, and then I'm going to skip to just a, a small portion of his genealogy that Matthew mentions. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, son of Abraham. Now, why does he mention David and Abraham? Because we know that uh, the Messiah would be from the line of David. He mentions Abraham because if you remember the religious leaders back then, they loved talking how they were children of Abraham. And so... Matthew decides to show them a few of the lesser sides of Jesus' heritage. So then he says, when he gets to verse 5, he says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, which I just love that name. I wish somebody would name their child Boaz, because it's just a cool name to say Boaz, okay? The father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Time out. Can we, can we stop there for a second? Rahab. I seem to remember the name Rahab because I'm reading through uh, the Bible again this year. And uh, uh, when you read through the Bible, you, you see at one point that the Israelites are going to go into Jericho. And so before they go into Jericho, they send some spies into Jericho on the wall. And so the spies are looking for somebody who maybe they can talk to. And so somehow, I have no idea how they know this, somehow they're either told or have been there before, they know where Rahab lives. Rahab, by the way, according to Scripture, is a prostitute. And they just happen to know where she lives. On the wall. So, for whatever reason, they go there, and they're talking to her, they're getting information, and then somebody hears, by the way, back then they had these huge, Jer Jericho had these huge walls. By the, they could, by the way, they couldn't, Archaeologically, they couldn't find it for a while. So this is one of the stories they said was made up in the Bible. And then guess what? They realized the river had moved. And guess what city they found? Oh, Jericho. It's amazing how they try to prove things that don't exist by saying we can't find them. I've lost my keys many times. I know they exist. Just, just a little archaeological fact there for you. So when you see archaeologists say, well, the Bible can't be true because we haven't found that. Just remember my keys, okay? You're like, I know the pastor has keys. That's why his wife bought him that cube. So when he pushes the button, he can find the keys. Two weeks ago when I said that, like 12 people called me. Where can I get my husband that cube? So there on the wall, the wall was built and there would be rooms actually like this size or bigger inside of the wall. And so that's where she was. And they came looking because they knew there were spies. So they came looking. They went to her house and she hid them. And I always think of it being under hay, but, you know, wherever. And, and so she hid them, hid the spies. They came looking. And then she got the spies out of there when nobody was looking. I'm guessing she had practice at that. Just saying. This is Jesus' lineage. Jesus is back. He, Matthew's not mentioning things by accident. 
He's not only mentioning Jesus' heritage, he's mentioning the women, which also was not always mentioned in that day. And so Jesus is saying, and when, when Matthew is saying, look at the life of Jesus, he says, and Rahab. But he doesn't stop there. Rahab, remember the prostitute? Oh, by the way, she, she hung a sign out. And, and he, they said, any of your family who wants to be saved needs to be in your house. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? Like Rahab going and getting family she hasn't talked to in years and going, you might want to spend the night tonight. And so they come in, remember the walls fall down, but their family, their whole family was saved. She then married into and took on the Jewish heritage, became Jewish as a prostitute, then became Jewish, repented of her lifestyle, gave her life to God, became Jewish, and she's now mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. Oh, but that's not all. Do you have family history? I'll never forget years ago, I said to my dad, I said, hey, dad, what's, you know, we were talking about genealogy at, at school. What's, do we know who's in our family? And this is what my dad said to me. He said, bunch of moonshine runners, so we don't want to know where they are. <laughs> now, so I laughed, thought my dad was kidding until I was talking to my aunt one day. And she said, oh, yeah, your great, great uncle was a moonshine runner in the middle of the state. He was also a state trooper and he killed somebody when they were running and they never did find him after that. That's a real story? I thought dad was, no, he was serious. That was part of the deal. I don't know about your heritage, but we all have that uncle, don't we? Sorry, Uncle Carl. It's not you. It's not you. Mother of Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. It's funny that Ruth's even mentioned, but Ruth actually did have some controversy uh, uh, in the society. But it continues. Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David, and we love King David. We look back and we say, David, what a man after God's heart, right? Who, you know, uh, killed a few people. And in order to point that out, he says, Jesse, the father of King David. And then he says, David was the father of Solomon. By the way, Solomon, wise in some ways, dumb in others. But then, whose mother, and I love this, he could have said whose mother was Bathsheba, right? Because that's the way he said everything. No, no. He said, whose mother was Uriah's wife. What? Why did he say it that way? Because there was this awesome warrior named Uriah who was married to this woman called Bathsheba, which is ironic. Bath. Sheba, and remember King David sees Bathsheba in the bath and says, bring her here. Bathsheba is pregnant. So David says, bring Uriah home. Uriah is such a good man that he comes home, sleeps on the porch to which David had to be going, what? He's sleeping where? Why don't you go in? Oh, because I shouldn't be inside when my men are out in the field fighting. I don't feel right not fighting or not I don't I shouldn't be comfortable when they're uncomfortable and David's like oh no no problem I have a solution and so back then what they would do is they would fight in rows and so you'd have a warrior behind you you'd have your sword and you'd be fighting a row of people and you'd fight 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 and then you'd go next when you got tired and then the next person would come which by the way if I was in that battle it'd be really quick Next, right? That would be me, right? So Uriah fighting, fighting, fighting. And David said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have everybody behind you, Uriah, withdraw. Isn't that awesome? What a good guy. So David has him withdraw, essentially killing Uriah, right? I mean, it looks like an accident. But I'm sure all the soldiers behind Uriah was like, that's some weird orders, right? So they all withdraw, and what happens? Uriah's killed. Why? Because he gets exhausted, and they just keep coming, and he is killed. When Matthew gives the lineage of Jesus, he said, <laughs> you remember David, who is the father of Solomon. Oh, yeah, great people. Who, you remember Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. Uriah's wife. He doesn't just say Bathsheba. He says, it's Uriah's wife. Like, did you not get the point? When you look back, even at the lineage of Jesus, you realize there are broken, 
messed up people, people who did not have their acts together, who God used to bring the Messiah to us. Do you realize that every time you come to church, whether you realize it or not, and I don't care if it's this church or another church, but every person who ministers or ministers to the other, other people is broken. Your favorite pastor in the world, who I know is probably not here this Sunday, that is, <laughs> is probably on TV, <laughs> is broken and messed up. Whether they admit it or not, they are. And yet, God uses broken people. And here's the deal for you. We tend to think, God can't use me. I'm broken. God can't use me. Eric, you don't know my history. You don't know what I've done in the past. You don't know where I messed up. Eric, you have no idea. If you only knew my story. And yet, Matthew all along says, hey, here's, here's the lineage of Jesus. Let's go ahead and start with some stories of what happened. But if that's not enough, he continues by giving the details in Matthew chapter 1, starting in 18, of how things happen. And he says this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Like, if the history wasn't enough, this is how it came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And then listen to this. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her publicly to disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. The word for divorce here can mean divorce. It can mean to put away. This is one of the passages that to me tells me that the Bible is true. It's one of these passages that a human or I would never write because my story would go like this. God came and told Mary and then the angel went and told Joseph before Mary told him. But no, the angel shows up, tells Mary, you're pregnant, congratulations. And she goes, how can this be? And he says, oh, Holy Spirit. So she goes to, to to uh, Joseph and says, by the way, I'm pregnant with the Holy Spirit's baby. Well, God didn't tell me. <laughs> so because he's a good man, what does he do? He doesn't believe her, of course. He thinks she's either lying or she's crazy. But because he's a man of integrity, what's he do? He says, I, I, I'm going to have her put away quietly. I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to separate from her. Or I'm going to maybe have her put away. This could literally mean. So he says all of these things here. And it says, hey. Have you ever had times in your life that it seemed like total chaos? You ever look at your life and you think things could go much smoother. If things were in a little different order. Jesus was born into the very same circumstances. God is even using the circumstances in your life that are confusing right now. They're frustrating. They're irritating. Maybe you look at your past and you think, well, gosh, if God could straighten that out, then maybe. Or if it's not your past, it's your present. Well, if other things would come together, then it would work. And yet God says, I am working all things together for my will. Jesus was an unlikely king born with an unlikely history. Listen to what Billy Graham says about the birth of Christ. Don't leave Jesus in the manger. Don't remember him only at Christmas. Instead, learn to walk with him every day as you pray and read his word and ask him to help you. I love that. So number one, he came from an unlikely history. Number two, he chose to be with us. Yesterday, I got a text at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It said, can you come give somebody a jump start? I thought, well, where are they? They're 45 minutes from you. Okay, I'll see who can give them a jump start. At the same time, one of our members, okay, it's Ernie, <laughs> said, I'll go give him a jump start. And then he realized, oh no, I'm going to get to their house. Their car's in the garage needing a jump start. We're going to have to push the car out. And then thankfully, his hero wife said to him, honey, you've got one of those things that you just carry that's a jump start thing. You don't even have to back the car out. 
So Ernie called her and said, I'm on the way. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the I'm on the way moment when somebody's done that for you. You love that person. One day, I broke down in Highway 50 in the big city of Titusville. By the way, when you hear me say big city of Titusville, that's a joke. Okay? I grew up in Miami, first moved to Titusville, and they would talk about let's go to the mall. And I remember thinking, what mall? And when I went to the mall, I said, you can play racquetball in here and not hit anyone. That tells you how long ago it was because people used to play something called racquetball. Racquetball was a... Never mind. Okay. Now it's pickleball. Right? So... So I'm in Titusville. My car broke down. I don't know anything about cars, but you know, you're pulled over. So what do you got to do? You got to open the hood because you have no idea what to do. So I open the hood. I'm looking. I think it's the battery, but I don't really know. All of a sudden I hear somebody pull up and they go, Eric Brookins. I look over. You ready for this? It is a friend of mine that I have not seen in over 25 years from high school that lives in Tampa that is driving to the Space Center to work on some stuff just temporarily. He left a little early, and as he's driving, he stops at the light, looks over from 25 years later, recognizes me, and says, Eric Brookins. And I went, Mike Peterson. <laughs> he said, are you okay? To which I wanted to say, yeah. Here's your sign. I said, no, something's wrong with my car. I said, I think it's a battery, but I don't know. He said, well, I got tools. So he pulled over. He got a wrench out, took my battery out. We went over to Walmart, got the battery tested. The battery was bad. And he came back and put the battery in the car. Can I tell you, it was awesome to have this unexpected, amazing surprise. And the fact that he even offered to do that was amazing. The fact of how everything came together was amazing. Whenever you've had somebody help you, it's amazing. But even bigger than that, listen, the God of the universe, the Bible says, chose to be with you. Chose to be with you. Listen to what it says in the scripture here. Matthew 1, verse 25, 22, we pick up there. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That's from Isaiah chapter 7, which means God with us. You realize that Jesus, with God's power, could have just Zoom called us, right? I mean, I know there was no Zoom then, but God's kind of ahead of technology. You realize that, right? I mean, he could have just sent a representative. He could have sent an angel, but he wanted to be with us. Part of the salvation message is the fact that God wants to know you. Has that thought blown you away yet? I mean, you know how you feel when somebody gives you a jump start and you're like, so th you're like, well, that's the best. Thank you so much. When somebody helps you when you really need it. When we really recognize that we are destitute without God's love and he chose to show up, it should blow us away. Listen to this next verse, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. And by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He made himself nothing. See, God could have just come to us in power. But love doesn't use power in order to get what it wants. Love doesn't manipulate. Love shows up. Years ago, when I was in high school, I got to be a roadie for different Christian bands. And so our church would set up for bands, and I would come early, and I would tape down their cords and roll out their microphones and hook up their guitar cords. And most of the time, the band members were warming up or doing something, and so you just kind of saw them, but you didn't really talk to them. And I'll never forget, I was down taping down some chords right down here. And this one musician, you've probably heard of him before. He was, uh, oh, what was the other guitarist's name? I know the one I'm... So this guitarist was so honored in the day so this that Jimmy Hendrix, when they asked him, who's your favorite guitarist, that Jimmy Hendrix, when they asked him, who's your favorite guitarist, Phil he named this Christian guitarist. The guy with Phil Kagan, right I'll never forget, sat down and, and sat on the stairs and said, hey, how you doing? 
And then he began asking me questions about school, asking me what I was doing, asking me where I was headed, all that kind of stuff. And I remember thinking, this guy's talking to me. Now, I had met a lot of Christian artists over the years. Most of them, like I said, were just busy, and most of them were just exhausted as they came through town. Some of them, I found out later, were inebriated, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> One of them just came out with a book that said that, said, that said that when they were traveling, they were inebriated. And I remember uh, uh, thinking, oh, they did seem kind of, okay, that makes sense. Anyway, so, but here's the thing. It was amazing to me that somebody would just stop, and here I was, a nobody, and just talk to me. The God of the universe did not choose to just use his power on you to force you to have a relationship with him. He came and said, I'm going to serve you. I mean, Jesus washed the disciples' feet the night before he goes to the cross. There's the Lord's Supper, and he washes his disciples' feet. He, you ready for this? He even washed Judas' feet. If I had been Jesus, I would have been like, okay, Matthew and, and, and John and Jude, I lost my towel. I don't know, Judas, I, right? But he washed even Judas' feet. That's how much he loves you. You ever feel like God doesn't love you? Recognize that the God of the universe wanted to have a relationship with you. That's the reason for Emmanuel, God with us. Finally, number three, he became a gift to us. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, talking about the wise men a few years later, most likely. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts, and you know this part of the story, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now I'm going to show you something that maybe you've never noticed. Do you know what the most important gift in this part of the story is? The wise men knew what it was. They were overjoyed to see the star. You know why? Because they were receiving a gift. They had heard about Jesus, the Messiah. Most likely with this gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they had come from Babylon. There was this guy way back in Babylon who, because he did not bow to a king... Because he refused to do and eat the meat, eat the food that he was told to eat, became the head of the magicians, they called him back then, which were the wise men. It was some guy named Daniel. And we believe that most likely Daniel had told them about the stars lining up and how that would represent the Messiah, the king of the Jews coming. And so when the wise men showed up, whether it was three or thirty, we don't know, and presented their gifts, they were not excited about their gifts. We talk a lot about the gifts of the wise men, but the truth is, Jesus was the real gift. And that's what they were excited about. They recognized that he's the one that's given them a gift. You, listen, people don't always understand when you're helping them. Have you figured that out? I, I used to teach school, and when I taught school one time, I was also, they gave me P.E., because it was like they needed somebody for P.E., so they said, uh, who are we going to use? Oh, yeah, you're free that period. You're in charge of P.E., junior high P.E., yeah. So junior high P.E. apparently had been chaos until I showed up, and I decided that I was going to teach these kids not to be that way. So we went out, 90 degrees, Florida day, went out. We had to run one lap around the field. So I'll never forget the first day, half of them walked. They came around. I looked at my watch. I said, well, it took you longer than three minutes to make it 300 yards so we get to go again. Go. They were much faster that time. The next day, they all ran, but a couple kids either missed the first day or weren't paying attention. They went too slow. I looked at all the students. I said, well, two of your friends were way too slow. Go again. The peer pressure was awesome from then on. Then I would take them in the gym on really hot days, and we would exercise in the gym or play in the gym, play games. They love to play battle ball or whatever we would play, you know, something to destroy people's eardrums. And, uh, uh, but sometimes there were puddles, and they'd walk in the gym, and of course there was always the one kid that heard his shoes squeak, so he would decide to squeak his shoes. Well, when they'd squeak their shoes, I said, oh, too much noise, run again. Then they would come inside. 
and on a squeaky day, you'd hear one kid squeak his shoes and all the other kids, take your shoes off if needed, you know, whatever. Nobody came in quietly, lined up. I had a student just a few years ago say, thank you for when you coached us in PE class. And then he said this, I was in the best shape of my life. At that time, they didn't know that I was trying to teach them discipline, to try to teach them, hey, this is how you need to learn to behave. And part of me was safety. I didn't want them all to die on my watch. And I was only 20-something years old, you know, so they were going to take advantage of me until they realized I was serious. When Jesus came, most of the people at that time did not know what they were getting, but it was awesome. Most of you day to day don't realize the gift that you've been given. So part of this message is for us to acknowledge that. Listen to what it says here. Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a, a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did Jesus do? He died to his own desires to bless us. We live in a world that wants all of us to become selfish and self-centered. We live in a world that says, if you give up your desires for something else, you lose. But Jesus called us to give up our desires to follow God. When we only want to follow our own selfish desires, that's called idolatry. When I was a kid, it was self-esteem, and then it became self-love, and now it's self-satisfaction. The truth is, God calls us to sacrifice ourselves. If you're here today, I want you to know one of God's first calls, the call to follow Jesus, is to leave everything behind and follow him. It's not easy. There's a lot of things that God calls us to do that are hard. The hardest thing is laying our own desires down and following him. If you're here today and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service. And I can talk to you about what it means to know Jesus To say, Jesus, I know you died and rose again for me. I know you died to pay for my sins. I surrender my life to you and I want to follow you. Last night, a guy came up to me after the service and gave his life to Christ. Maybe you want to do that today. If you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've been following your own desires, just be honest about it. That's called sin. Confess it to him and make it right, and he'll renew you again. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you laid down your life for us. You humbled yourself to the cross. And Father, if we're honest, sometimes we don't even like to give up what we want. So Father, I pray that even today we could humbly sacrifice, lay down our own desires in order to serve you. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.